Okay, so we have two vertebrates here. We've got a seal and a penguin. They're both vertebrates. So we looked at this in lab the other day. So are there four limbs, meaning they're front limbs, like our arms? Are there four limbs, homologous, vestigial, or analogous? Which one? Okay, so we have an A, I hear A and C. It's not B, they definitely are using them. So let's think about, let's look at analogous first. Analogous means that they have similar functions, but the composition of the forelimbs are very different. I gave you a clue in saying they're both vertebrates. We're a vertebrate, right? You guys studied vertebrates in the lab, which means that both of these have a humerus, a radius, and an ulna, carpals, metacarpal, phalanges. So now knowing that, what's the answer, C or A? Yeah, A is the answer, so they are homologous. If I ask this question on an exam, I'd give you a little more information, like I did say they're both vertebrates, so that would help you. Okay, last couple points of data that supports that evolution is a theory. And again, remember theory, meaning that a lot of people in the scientific community have taken a lot of data. Everybody agrees that that data comes to the conclusion that living things do evolve or change over time. So we can look at embryos. You're gonna look at embryos today in lab under the microscope. Embryos, the way that anything is formed, any cell is formed, is that the genes determine how it is formed and function, what it looks like. So the way that embryos are determined, the way they're going to look is by their genetics or their DNA. The more similar two embryos are, the more related those two organisms are. So we can look at the very earliest stages of development and see, do those two stages of development look a lot alike? Or do they not? So we're gonna take a look at a little bit of embryos in lab. You're gonna look at a pig and a chick from a chicken. And you're gonna see that, do they look alike or not look alike and how in lab? So as adults, right, as embryos, we can look and see, are these two things similar? So if we looked at like a pig and a bunch of humans, if I said, which one is the pig? Point to the pig. Yeah, okay, so you guys can tell as adults, an adult pig is very different than humans, right? But look at the human and the pig as embryos. Would it be easy to tell them apart? No, right? So they look very similar. Here's a lemur, which is um, one of the primates, one of the other primates. So they all look very similar. So would you agree that these organisms have a common ancestor? Right? So they look very similar. Early stages of embryonic development show that these have a common ancestor. So we definitely can use the resemblance between embryos as data to show whether two organisms are closely related. So even if we've looked at some things that are asexually reproducing and unicellular, like bacteria, for example, and we know that a bacteria, when it's getting ready to reproduce, it grows in size and then it splits into two. If we saw two different bacterial organisms and we watched their early stages of development, meaning that they grow in size and they split into two, we could say those are more closely related to each other than they are to us. All right, last bit of data. Biochemistry, we have come so far, so fast, so interesting, and we're still gonna go really far, really fast now. 
we can use biochem biochemistry more concretely. So like with the embryo, if you look at the two and say, yeah, they look alike, with the biochemistry, we can look at literal nucleotides, the A's, the T's, the G's, the C's. If we're looking at RNA, we can also use U. And we could compare and say, oh, well, between these two organisms, for this kind of protein that they both have, they have in common 30 out of 50 nucleotides. So it's super concrete. So this has been a way for us to, when we take two things like a pig and a chick or a pig and a human, and we said, yeah, they look alike in the early embryonic stages, we can say exactly how much alike we are and how closely related we are to a pig and a lemur. So it's been really fascinating. We've seen a lot of the hypotheses of the past of these two things are closer related because they look alike, because they have the same limb structure, because the skulls are similar but different. Now we can really specifically kind of do a hierarchy or do some like orderliness to how related they are. With the advancements in biochemistry, so much has changed and so much constantly changes as more organisms have portions of their genomes sequenced out or whole genomes sequenced out. So things constantly are changing in the kind of tree of life. So pretty cool. All right, so one of the things that we can do, because we use DNA and RNA to compare amino acid sequences in a protein, one of the ones that is common to almost all organisms is cytochrome C. So from bacteria, archaea, protists, plants, animals, many organisms have and produce this particular protein. So what biochemists have done is they will find that protein and then they will compare that protein between all of these different organisms and start to realize like this is potentially how they could be related. So a lot more concrete. So same thing with genes. We can look at proteins, we can look at genes. We can look at the A's, T's, G's, C's in a gene, and we can see how are these things specifically related. So again, more base sequences mean more closely related. So what we do know and this is kind of the big picture idea using biochemistry that related organisms share DNA and common DNA sequences. So this constantly, things are being updated using the biochemistry method. And this is kind of like a backup for the other forms of data to support that evolution is a theory. So this is kind of nice because it gives us just that little like backup to other ideas that we have. So here's cytochrome C. If we look at the sequence of cytochrome C, the gene that produces this particular protein in a mouse and a human, what you can see is they've gone through and this is what they would do. They would sequence out that particular gene that creates this particular protein. And then they highlight, oh, wait, let's see. These are the only differences. This is different, but everything else is the same, right? So everything in blue is different. Only 30 different nucleotides between a human and a mouse. So that's what they've been doing is they've been using this particular protein and the gene sequence for this particular protein to show what's the difference between them. So pretty close. So it's uh, very, you can see, very concrete then. All right, and then I think we end this chapter on a question. Here's an analogy. You guys who will go on to take boards and exams, PCAT and MCAT and what other, whatever other boards you will be taking, we'll get a lot of questions like this. So. These are good practice questions. So what you're looking for is this is to that. So a major trend in evolution is that this forms 
or these forms give rise to these ones. Simple to more complex. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so good. Yeah, see that simple, that simple forms give rise to complex ones. A lot of times what people are inclined to choose, smaller to larger. And we have talked about that. How with the glyptodont and the armadillo example that we actually went from larger to smaller in that example. Good. Okay, so C is correct. Oh, sorry, and we're not done. Climate change, always an important topic and really hot <laughs> topic today. Okay, so climate change influences evolution and it's actually causing organisms to evolve quicker. What has caused acceleration in climate change is human, humans, not just one, many. So humans are agents of natural selection, meaning that we are changing the environment and we know that changes in the environment favor organisms who have the genes that are most advantageous. If we are quickly changing environments by burning fossil fuels, by eating meat, by doing industrial processes, that means that we are causing organisms to adapt or not adapt. And we are either favoring certain organisms or not favoring them. So I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, so one is when we overuse have overused pesticides on our plants, it has favored organisms who are resistant to those pesticides. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that if we're going to spray pesticides, we're trying to kill insects that eat corn, for example, we spray that all over the corn, most of those insects die that are eating the corn, except for 5%. That 5% that survive, they start to reproduce, increase the number, and then in maybe five years, the pesticide that we're using doesn't work anymore. Okay, so now we have to make a new pesticide. Well, what do those pesticides do to us? Do you think they're healthy for us? No, they're not healthy for us. So then is it healthy for other organisms too? No, not healthy for other organisms too. So we then have to use a new pesticide, a stronger pesticide, probably more chemical based, more damaging to us. Do you think some of the insects in that population may be resistant? Maybe, right? So we go through the cycle about every five years. Oh. You all are going to visit this idea in lab 22. So the overuse of antibiotics and what that's doing for us today. Another one is overfishing. As there's more demand to eat fish, what's happening in the nets is that the size of the nets is not allowing the juveniles to escape. So if we're eating the juveniles of a species, is there any organisms and populations to reproduce? Is that a good idea for us? No, it's not profitable, right? So that if we are eating all of the juveniles along with the bigger adult fish, don't we wanna keep eating in the future? So this is definitely something that we have to rethink in our strategy. A lot of times this isn't rethought because people want to profit today and they don't care about the future. So the bottom line is, ooh, money, 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 money. Not a good idea. All right, so blah, blah, blah. We all know this, right? So reduction in ice and snow. Good thing is climate change has caused more warmth so we do get longer growing seasons and we'll get to why that's not necessarily always a good thing. On occasion, there are benefits to climate change, but there are very few. A lot of shifts in the life cycles of different species. So anybody who migrates, like birds, how they do those big migrations, 
they have to, they're kind of like genetically predisposed to the behaviors that they have. And so they just kind of genetically know, oh, I'm going to start migrating because it's getting warmer. And so they start doing it. But when it doesn't get, when it gets warmer sooner, that kind of messes with their behavioral genetics. And then there's this kind of conundrum in them, like, wait, it's, I thought, and they don't know why they're thinking this, but I thought it was supposed to get warm in March and it starts getting warm in February. And so then sometimes the, they wait, but there's no food then when they get to the next place. So it kind of causes these confusions in migratory animals also. Ah, mosquitoes. Anybody get bit by tons of mosquitoes really early on through now? Yeah, I got one right here that's itching me. So we are seeing that usually what we would have with mosquitoes is that mosquitoes would have one life cycle over the course of a year in our area because we're seasonal. But because the warm season has gotten much longer, they're able to fit in two life cycles. So now we have mosquitoes early in the spring and late into the fall. For us, it's, you know, an annoyance, right? You get mosquito bites, you go out, and you get bit up. But what about for people who live in areas where mosquitoes cause very severe diseases like malaria? That's not good. For them, it's not just an annoyance. It's life-threatening that the mosquitoes have a longer growing season. What about places that are now warmer where they haven't been warm before? In some tropical places, they're seeing malaria spread where it has never existed. That's really bad. So while it's kind of an annoyance in our area, it's life-threatening in many areas of the world. Oh, how cute, right? So this is a red squirrel. Wait, I'm sorry. Mm -mm. Uh, how would change before humans? Before That's a really good question. And we have a lot of data to show that it would go, it, it would still cycle up and down. So what we know over time in terms of climate change before humans had the industrial revolution and we started making things go a lot quicker in terms of warming and other extreme weather events, um, it did cycle. There's natural cycles of the earth where it would get really warm and then it would get really cold, right? We've had warm ages and we've had ice ages and they go up and down. So it's always interesting when people say, I don't believe in climate change. And I say, well, it's been happening for 4 billion years. What's not to believe, right? Of course you believe in climate change. You know, ice, remember ice ages? Remember dinosaurs? All those things show the climate has changed over time, right? Dinosaurs went extinct because of climate change. We have ice ages in the past because of climate change. But now, with burning fossil fuels and eating meat and industrial processes, we have extremes. So we've never seen quite the extremes. I mean, an ice age seems pretty extreme, but it's a natural extreme. So where it kind of went up and down like this, it's gone like that. And we're up here. And we don't know when we'll ever come back to cold or an ice age, if we will. Certainly, it may be the demise of humans that will allow this to come back down. So good, very good question. So this squirrel. They are reproducing 18 days earlier than they were in the past. Is that a big deal? Well, what if they're reproducing earlier because they're getting some kind of signals, but the plants that they eat are not producing the food that their offspring need that 10 days earlier? Could that be critical for their offspring to survive? Absolutely. So not everything cycles in line. And so in this case, it can be really bad, Com more competition, right? If the food is not available for their offspring, 
Do you think the moms and dads are going to compete hard with each other then? Yeah, so then there's going to be a lot more competition to help their offspring survive. The other thing that we know is that those that can then outcompete the other ones, those genes are being passed on. So not only are there genes for, okay, we are reproducing earlier, but who's the better competitor to keep their offspring alive? Those genes are now being favored. So definitely it's influencing the gene pool of this population. Here's another one. So in the past, the tawny owl, uh, the snowy owl, sorry, snowy owl, the snowy owl, this brown version was more favored. No, sorry, I'm going backward. Sorry, this version was more favored because there was more snow. With more snow on trees, does this kind of look like maybe like a tree covered in snow? You've got a little bit of the bark color and the snow color. And so they could sit on a, a, snowed, a snow covered tree and blend in. Would this one stick out more on a snowy tree? Yeah. So now that there's less snow and the tree's more brown with less white, this one is being favored with less snow with more warmth from climate change. So we're seeing again the gene pool change from this adaptation being favored to this adaptation being favored. And we are causing all of these examples to happen. So one of the things that we hypothesize as scientists is that every species on the earth is being affected by humans causing climate change. That's big. Every species is being affected in some way. Okay. So that finishes up our evidence for evolution. We're going to go on 